Hello and welcome to this week's Mad Axman podcast. This is the 12th, the dozen. We've made a dozen. So um, a remarkable achievement in this time of lockdown. Um, we also managed to squeak over two hours with this one, cover all the usual bases, what we painted, what we played, some online stuff, some, some real world stuff, some obscure stuff involving ships this week as well. Um, we also talk about the Napoleonic Wars in our regular feature, Teaching to Me About Napoleon. Um, Andy's quiz returns, Andy's quiz music returns, you'll be pleased to know, and we discuss in great depth the late Roman army in Art de la Guerre. So all of those things are, are waiting for you, so sit back, listen to the music, listen to the pod, and enjoy your painting. This means war. And welcome yet again to number 12. It's a round dozen for um, the lockdown podcasts. It's a round dozen podcasts. It's a full set of seven people here. All the numbers are adding up. Um, astonishingly, it appears that I think nearly 110 people have already listened to last week's podcast within the last three days since we released it on, on Friday evening. So I think that's a ringing endorsement of how terrible the weather was in, in the UK at the weekend and how little barbecue and outdoor maintenance managed to get done by by everybody. Um, but without further ado, into our regular start, um, our regular first hour almost of, um, of, of the normal podcast. So um, looking around the screen, straight in the middle, Mr. Cool Kids, Adam Warsdale. Last week you were, were starting with some, um, uh, you were thinking about starting with some Romans, but I guess you had to put them together. And you were doing something with goblins as well. But um, what's oh. what's the painting cue this week for for the boy Warsdale? Um, the Romans are in the queue. They're not going to be for quite a while. But um, I was going to do um, some Lord of the Rings scatter terrain that you get in the box and some Russian tanks. Now I had a bit of a slow week. <coughs> uh, I didn't do the tanks, but I did the Lord of the Rings scatter terrain, and I was going to do it really, really quick. Try bus grey, bit of ink it's maybe. Gosh. But there's um. There's a couple of pieces where it's like, if you remember the film and the books where they're in this sort of like hall with books in and mm -hmm. Games Workshop, they're quite good at little details like that. So there's lots of open books around and pages lying on the ground. Okay. And I was just going to paint them white or um, ivory because I almost never use white except to highlight um, ivory, but it didn't look right because it was just a blank page. Okay. So you've got to do some writing on them. And then I thought, ah, I've got a good, I've got a good uh, magnifying glass um, with a daylight bulb around it, so I could actually do. I'm, I'm sorry, right, right. Room. We're going to stop. We're going to we're going to interject there then. So you've got a magnifying glass with a daylight bulb light around it. Is this, yeah, is it's this on an articulated powered? arm. Yeah, on an I've articulated arm. Just, yeah. just you happen to have that lying around. As you do. Well, it's as toy soldier painters do. And did did yeah, you buy it? When did you get that? Has that been something? Oh, Oh, years ago. It's just like it's just a very good um, lamp for giving light when you're painting, okay. but it just happens to be around a magnifying glass. And how how yeah. do you? Because I've, I've got because I've got a magnifying glass on an arm as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, but I always find well, I struggle when you're using the magnifying glass to kind of you you know the scale disappears. So I find it actually oh, harder depth to perception. paint. Depth perception goes all yeah. skewy. I always, almost never use a magnifying glass for that reason. It's all a bit, unless you're doing something really fine where you've got to see cl clearly, I wouldn't use it. So you're but, already using it as a light then? Um, yeah, usually. Okay. But because I've got it, I thought, ah, because it's Lord of the Rings, I could actually, rather than just do squiggles and pretend it's writing, um, with a magnifying glass, I could actually do proper elven runes. And then I thought... In what I scale is this? Do, what, what scale it's is this? 28 mil. 28 mil, 20, okay. Yes, which is why you need magnifying glass. And then I thought, because it's a whole actual language, which you can find online, I could write actual elven words in these books. And then I thought, that's oh mental. Oh my God, I'm a war gamer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, that's mental. Put the idea down and step away from the idea. So yeah. in the end, I just did do the sort of like squiggles and a bit of an ink wash, so it, it looks like painting. But it's... I mean, it's like, I've, my wife's got a theory that sort of like all Toy Soldier players are somewhere on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I yeah. was getting to the point of, yeah, it's like, it's just as long the as the colour spectrum. Could... <laughs> yeah. And I decided just as long as I could still realise that that's mad, yeah. it means I'm not mad. 
You're not mad. That's good. That's the Yossarian approach, isn't it? It's catch yeah. You know you're going to look back at it and wish you had. <laughs> had. Had you worked out what words you were going to write there in Elvish? Well, Elven. no. It's, as I say, it's like I, I stepped back from that one right. um, <laughs> okay. quite gingerly. Right. So you've, you've done a kind of relatively slack version of a book. And, and, and but what about the scatter terrain? You know, because Games Workshop scatter terrain, I have a, a sort of mortal fear that it's the most expensive thing in the world for what it is. But well, well no, because I got this, I mean, because I got the Lord of the Rings starter box, and it's because when it first came out, I'm a sucker for Lord of the Rings, so I was going to buy it, I just didn't because I thought oh, I can't be bothered. And then years after, after nobody played Lord of the Rings, um, there was an unopened, still in a cellophane box on eBay for not very much money. And so I bought it because... You'd accidentally on eBay and you accidentally typed in Lord of the Rings 28. Something like that. I can't, just, I can't remember the, the pen, Slip the keyboard, yeah. But, he wants um, the precious. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's just been in the cupboard again for another how many years. Um, and then I sort of like ended up painting the toys. So as there were these bits of terrain in there as well, just to sort of like finish it off, I did them as well. And um, the kids, I'm going to, the Lord of the Rings game is actually quite good. Hmm. It's a well designed skirmish game. So I'm going to play it with the kids. And then the scatter terrain is useful because I can see yeah. I'll end up doing the D&D &D with them and stuff as well. So yeah, all good, all useful. Um, and now it's done. Excellent. So, and did you do any of the tanks, did you say, or did they just sit while you were doing, did Simon they, do runes? Yeah, they just, um, they just, because again, in a way, they're so, in a way, the two things I was going to do last week was so quick and easy, mm. I didn't quite get around to starting both of them. Right. <laughs> okay. You kick them. So is it is um so you didn't even get the the Romans and start snipping them off the sprues or or sticking a few together? Oh no! As I say, the no. Romans are in a queue. They're, oh, okay. they're not going to be for a while because I want to finish off the Mongols before I get there. But, ah, okay. Then. Um, because my lead and plastic mountain has been going down, so. Right. You've got to build it up a bit. You've got to build it up again, then. Okay, and going going kind of clockwise. Peter, you're um, you're you're there still with a, a battlefield in the background on your Zoom background. Um, I think some of the troops appear to be dressed in white. Um, are you? I, but I I have a suspicion that you became sick of Austrians at some point this week. Yes, and, and just started in, in mainlining I, some sort of fantasy weirdness. Yeah, I there was um, well. I got fed up painting white, so I thought, what can I do that's not white? And so I've got some of these uh, Reaper miniatures from one of the Kickstarters I did, and always got around to painting them. And there was a bit on the uh, club forum about how a couple of people were looking at doing Art de la Guerre, but in fantasy. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at some of the figures I've got, realized I've got shed loads of different things. And um, Richard mentioned and what, about why Dragon did you? Husband. Why did you invest in a plastic fantasy kickstarter and when was that um well one i've invested in several um oh. and two got two boys so the uh, bones miniatures are great because they're pretty indestructible yeah they're super super stuff aren't they yeah um they're, they're lovely i mean they're, they're really good um models actually there's some um lots of sort of character to them and everything else um, but they're nice and flexible, so with having kids and that, it's not as though we're going to get broken very easy, like hard plastic, because it's soft plastic. So, you, so your, your, your theory is you bought nice. them for the kids? You're saying you bought them for the kids? Yeah, it was for yeah. the kids. Yeah, yeah. it's always yeah. for the kids. So, so what have you been doing? What have you been painting? Um, well, I've been painting a, a gorilla with wings, um, of a whole host of goblins and orcs, and the latest one is a reptile with a couple of swords and um and of course a dwarf riding a bear because well you've got to have that in your army yeah and what what's the, what's the paint scheme for a winged gorilla is there a nap you know is there a uniform guide <clears throat> they're not somebody um, dressed in white with yellow cuffs are they well i, I a present i got was uh, a whole box of this uh, Valagio game color uh, for one birthday and there's all these lovely colours that I haven't got around to using because I was painting things like Austrians or things that would need green um, for like World War II. So I went to all the colours that I hadn't used yet and picked out something which su seemed suitable for a winged beast, Storm Blue. Um, so I'm 
slowly working my way through all the random colors I haven't used so I can use like jade green and things because why not it's, brown. it's not white actually you know I've, I've got a couple of jade greens and I've, I've started using them much more on the ancient figures it's a really you know bold oh, color and then even a bit of a wash on it it tones it down so yeah it's picking up the scales quite nicely on this lizard type thing and a lizard with two swords because you know a lizard with one sword wouldn't be scary enough really would it oh I yeah guess. and they've got a bow on the back because you know you just have to bit of ranged yeah. ranged attack so yeah. does, does that mean the austrians just got to a point and just they got white washed. The, the austrians are still uh-huh. awaiting their reinforcements through the post Ah, uh, so you ran out then? You didn't, um, you didn't down yeah. down tools, or you just ran out of finished ones? I, I've just run out. I'm just, uh, supposedly they've been dispatched by Eureka UK. Um, mm. It's just when they turn up is a different matter. So okay. I think this time next week Vega I'll be back is at UK Whitewash. Post. Hmm? Vega is for UK Post at the moment. Well, yeah, I can't really complain. But, you know, uh, as Adam was saying, I'm starting on the lead mountain by uh, starting the plastics. And it means, of course, I've got to now go and buy Dragon Ramp because I've got to use the figures in something other than just, well, it's a pretty good reason to use some weird colours. Yeah, so, more rules. That had become really popular down the club, hadn't it? It's one of those Osprey, you know, yeah. whatever they are, 10 quid books or something. But it seemed yeah. to... To really pick then it up also people. means I started looking at Mantic and some of the other stuff and Oaths Mark about you can get some lovely dwarf <laughs> miniatures and goblins riding wolves and things like this as a unit. So if Richard ever gets around to doing Art Liga in fantasy, I've now worked out my unit in my mind about X number of goblin riders on wolves uh, and various other things. So unfortunately, I'm, you know, that lead mountain mountain is just not going down. Yeah, it's I've, diversifying. I've been, I have been tempted by those sort of Oathmark and Frostgrave figures to to see whether they would be compatible with um, you know the the Warlord ones and the Gripping Beast ones and stuff. But I just fear they might be a bit too heroic scale to mix in. I don't know. Um, if the, you know no, the I, and I got some individual figures because um, they just looked really nice yeah. uh, figures. And they seem to go quite nicely with um, some of the other stuff I had for a saga. Okay. So, Ooh, wow. yeah. So some of the saga stuff, when um, you looked at, um, oh, what's the, the key saga one? Yeah, Gripping Beast. Yeah, Gripping Beast. Some of the Gripping Beast stuff. Um, the plastics are a little bit smaller than the Gripping Beast, but the normal uh, metal ones seem to fit quite nicely alongside it. And if it's fantasy, I'm not worried about it. Yeah, because I, I think I was looking at some of some of the probably the Frost Ray, one of the Warriors sets, and trying to work out in my head if I could turn them into De Lamai because they were kind of wearing all sorts of Hillman type outfits. But oh, I know the one. Yeah, oh, yeah. barbarians. Yeah, barbarians. Yeah, Hillman hunters. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, barbarian hunters. Have you, Tamsin? You have you seen any of those in the flesh? Or yeah. Uh, no, I haven't actually. Right. Okay. And nobody else yet. I just see them online. They they seem to, but there's all like nicely pro painted ones online. All right. So so it's just been how many figures then? Is it been? Is there, is there a count this week, Peter? Or um ah just about a dozen. I guess I'm also doing some goblins and things as well because you've got to have fun with goblins. I like goblins. It's a goblin off, yeah. so to speak. Um, yeah. And on that it's note, like, uh, they're, yeah. they're suitably pyrotechnic. Okay. The use right. of language in Toy Soldier is quite interesting because the question you asked at the beginning of talking to Peter hmm. is a question that I'd expect to hear in a police interview. Yeah. So, Mr. Webb, when did you decide to invest in the plastic fantasy Kickstarter? Yes. <laughs> yes. When was your wife aware of this fact? Yes, indeed. Uh, she was when the box turned up. Yeah. That's normally <laughs> the time at which people it. find out, isn't it? And, and, she, and she said, what is this? Um, but no, she was quite pleased because there it was a nice mixture of stuff. So I've got the next one coming. So um, I was just looking at the different figures in that. It's a quite nice mix. Um, there's lots of characters with it. Um, I just like it from that perspective. It's not overly expensive when you're doing the Kickstarter. Um, and it's a nice surprise when the box finally turns up. I, I guess it's something that you can credibly tell the other half is actually for the kids with, with a reasonably um, straight yeah, face. Yeah, not anymore. Not anymore. That's given up. But she likes painting the dragons anyway, so. Okay. That's a good result. Kids are older than you are. 
<laughs> the kids are bigger than I am now. In yes. all terms, that's for sure. This means war. So going around again, and Dave, you you look like you're still. Is that still another bottle of Hefesteiner? Will you ever run out of that, or is this no, something no, else? No, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I've been discussing the fact that it should be able to recycle the bottles back to the brewery in this country, but it's impossible. In Germany, they they come and pick up the bottles. Yeah, it's a long way in lockdown, though, isn't it? You'd have to yeah, drink a lot to make it worth their while doing. But I think I'm, I'm, you know, I think I have drunk quite a lot. And might be worth doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it could be that so what um i've seen some of your egyptians this week what's been what's what's been the discoveries of um your egyptian odyssey the, the bowmen are good a little bit of flash on the arms i've discovered i've got to, I've got, i need to pare them down and tidy them up a bit more before spraying them but i've done four bases of bowmen five bases of bowmen which is enough for, to be going on with although i think i've got enough figures for another three or four bases of bowmen which mm -hmm. is going really strong on the bowman. And so the bowman will be finished. I'm about to start doing all the skirmishes. And I've started on one of the chariots. But like with chariots, it's always difficult. And I don't know. Yeah. Because we were talking about the wheels and the axles last week. Have you had a yeah, kind of a, um, a wheel I have wobble? To, you're right. They do bend today. Yeah. But also, um, I'm just work, trying to think out of, a, out of a go faster paint scheme for the uh, <laughs> chariots. And how That's much quite how much blue to put on the uh, non-Pharaoh chariot? So number one chariot is being painted as we and, dis, and, and figuring about. I quite like the horses. Not sure I like the chariot figure so much. I'm, I'm thinking when I do buy the chariots, I'm gonna, I might even go for the Syrian, the sort of Mitanni figure mm. and not use the Egyptian ones. Yeah, I think I found when, um, certainly with, with Assyrians and um, Mycenaeans, at least you know what to paint the chariots to give them a bit of colour. You know the the Assyrians have got those those stickers that I use, and then the, yeah. the Mycenaeans you do with the cowhide, but the Egyptian ones it's they're just sort of wicker baskety type things, and it's how do you give them colour without it looking like you painted them as a toy soldier player? Yeah, as a day a like go faster stripes and stuff. Yeah, yeah bit of a challenge. But I mean, like, I, I've got a whole drawer full of um, Magus and Militum, the old small chariots, those ones with all the multicolour bardings on the chariot horses and that and because i painted them years ago for dbn the yuga army and i've got hundreds of those and i don't like those but we, we'll get there considering yeah. i need to have 12 chariots it's going to be an interesting debacle so. why do you I'm need sure to you have need, 12 you don't need to have 12 i'm sure no but 12 would be useful to have all the options there's <laughs> need and want always yeah. remember that yeah the How less says that? he can so yeah. How many times are you going to ever deploy 12 chariots? No, maybe, I know, maybe done it. <laughs> I think no, no, I definitely I, I, need to have, I need to have seven in the army plus three generals. So that's 10. Yeah, I think the, you've got um, to have a choice between the stripy hats going forward to back and from side to side. Yeah, so and blue and white and red and white. Hat. Yeah. No, I must admit, Peter, I think I've tried that army a few times. And, and the answer is how many times will you deploy 12 chariots? The answer is just the once. Yes. Um, that's more from, <laughs> what, from, from that my experience like of attempting to make that successful, but yeah. it, it didn't really People work. Stripy hats. Yeah. No, those stripy hats are, are, are solid. Kind you know, of Sunderland um, fans or something. I think that's the other way around. They're probably some some second division Portuguese team or something with the, the horizontal red hoops or something yeah. on it. All right. Okay. So Tamsin, Tamsin, to you next and your your judge judge dread background, and I think you were. Oh, I'm going to do the three wheels or something, wasn't it? Um, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, so, so right. working through, I actually. Oh, it comes with slide presentation. Wow, yeah. that's, very, that's very nice, Tamsin. Is there oh, anything? Right. The that... So, this is your, you painted up this terrain to start with, then the other week, the housing and no. things like that. No. No, I think it's I painted, I've, I've painted all the judges' figures and the lawmasters, and I thought, I like a bit of terrain as a backdrop, so I looked through the MDF pile and found found a suitable suitable M I build it, factory building from Sarissa and I went to town a bit with it by adding posters, graffiti and stuff. Oh, I'm really just neat. thinking you probably really spent ages really making nice. that terrain look so grotty. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, it looks uh, cool. Three, round, three successive rounds of weathering, adding posters and graffiti to get it to the... I like the crack in, I like the crack in the upper uh, wall. That looks quite neat. Is that, that's, yeah, that's part of the MDF. Oh, I see. Right, okay. And are these are these metal figures or plastic figures underneath? These are all the new warlord, warlord resin. So it's sort of resin. Okay. So it's a plasticky resin that they spin cast. Those okay. lore masters are quite nice. Yeah. Is that supposed to be Anderson? Yes. Okay. That's good. I got. And are these photos up on your blog already, um, as well? Or? Uh, they're on. There's a link through to p p p I the quarantine challenge on my on my blog. There's a link through to the quarantine challenge blog where you got all the pics. All these photos. These are fantastic. They're really, really good. good. I love the highlighting. That so so those. So we were talking last week about what what was the core judge color, which was sort of. It looks like you've gone a really went, dark blue with I some highlights. I the so the. Pretty much a standard comic book. Yeah. I so black with black with dark blue highlighting. Okay. Is there any specific colours that you used on those? That um, because that looks a really yeah strong colour. Black mixed with dark Prussian blue, and then with dark blue added for the second highlight. Okay. If you're oh, going to be topical, you should have a bit of graffiti. This is Dominic was here. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't think of that. I should have done. <laughs> I think there's still, you know, there's a lot of graffiti on it, but there might still be a little bit more room for for a bit of Don oh, was yeah. here. There's room for more. No, there's definitely room for more. Uh, Mega City actually... Bond, not Durham. Oh, sorry. Uh, Maybe that was that one. That's one for Simon. Welcome, welcome from down. Graffiti <laughs> <laughs> from uh... down under. De oh, is that Dave for Mayor? Is that one there as well? Yeah, uh, Dread fans will know that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that. That's not a not Dave a was an orangutan. Dave he got was an orangutan. Is he no, he died. Oh gosh. Yeah. He was assassinated. Wow. That's a bit cruel. Right. No, these are fabulous. Well we'll definitely get a link to um on, on this week's episode to those because those are those are awesome. And and you used the did the yeah, plastic uh, the clear plastic bases come with them? Or was um was that something you chose to put them on? That was something I chose to put them on. I they come with Sort of standard cast on metal, cast on bait, cast okay. with cast on bases. Uh, I just cut those, cut them off from those before painting, mm. which in hindsight was a little bit of a mistake. Well, you're not, you're not convinced now by the clear plastic mm. now you put them on. Um, oh, no, I'm convinced by that. It was just a mistake to remove the, remove the cast on bases before painting them, I think. Oh, I see. You had nothing to, to hold them with. I oh, so inserted. Sewing pin, sewing pins in, uh, snipped off the the nub bit and put them into the cork. But it wasn't as strong a hold as it should have, should have been. So some of them kept falling off or spinning. Right. Okay. I, having finished the judges, I moved on to the next batch of figures, which was some city death. Hmm. I the citizens' defence force design. Cause each block has their own militia unit who called out in times of disasters or or attacks just general violence uh, to assist the to, or in, as required requested by the judges to assist them or sometimes uh, to fight the block. they use the mega city one being what mega city one is they're typically populated in drawings of malcontent paranoid nutters i mean, all sorts of idiots. You should um, have a statue on a pin being pulled like, down giving, there. Um, access to high-grade military weapons is probably not the best idea. Mm. Uh, so frequently involved in wars against other blocks and so on. Just uh, general, general thievery. Yeah. Do so Warlord do? Sorry, do Warlord do East Meg judges? They've got only two so far. Okay. Uh, well, they've got two. East Meg agents. So you've got Orlock the Assassin and his satellite, and you've also got a female East Meg agent. Mm -hmm. Ooh, nice I just think the East Meg judges have got better uniforms. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, not, maybe not as cool as the, as the Vatican judges. Vatican judges? I think. <laughs> Wow. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's getting pretty niche, isn't That's it? Even, even for niche comic book stuff. Mind you, I mean, the Hondo City judges. They're pretty cool. This is way after I stopped reading 2000. Yeah. <laughs> so, Cue so that Monty um, Python sketch about the church police. 
<laughs> so with um you know with these small batch you know almost in well literally individual figures <laughs> painting do you what what sort of the batch size that you do and do you do one color on on half a dozen of them or or one color across the whole job lot or do you just do each individual figure with the different colors with, and then go back to it I mean, with those ones i did for i mean, well those were, they were pretty uniform so mm. i just did the whole batch in one go, go. so for the what? judges that was nine foot and two riders and the city deaf it was nine foot and I, do so, you find that you go back and and add more details than you think and correct stuff or you know are you able to do one pass of one color and and then that's done uh, do you, um, you go back and repaint stuff out at all do, do you plan it out in advance I, or do you just kind I of plan, do it I tend to work inside out so starting with the foot furthest back i don't think i really had to do any any clean up i it's only possibly on the judges i had to go back and do with a with a black glaze to tone down the by a second highlight a bit okay wow all right interesting um so yeah some of those low batch stuff is a bit like when i was doing well i suppose adam as well when we were both doing malifaux you'd end up doing a, a crew or a handful of people which is just so different to doing the mass industrial you know 15 25 mil army stuff um, but it was just which which points you started chopping and changing things. Yeah, um, I mean, so I've started work on the on the gangs now, like the gang members now. So that's all going to be very individual. But I'll try to repeat colours where I can. Yeah, get a palette. Okay, interesting. Um, I see. And then Andy, um, what's what's this week? You were doing. I think had you done the dogs last time for your Irish? Yeah, done... yeah. I finished the plastic paddies. They're all done. Yeah. So I'm now on the metal mix, the um, metal figures which Clive had given me beforehand, and I'm going to have to get that drill out one day and drill holes in hands to put spears in. Ah, so, and these are still 28 mil figures. Um, yeah, yeah. This is a Saga war band, and I'm about, I suppose, about halfway through the whole lot. And um, but I've just got one lot of militia, a couple of kind of half guardy types, and a boss man. So I've I'd say I've more than half done it. You know, the militia figures, they're not very much, the levies, there's not very much on them to paint, so they'll be fairly mm. basic. Do you know which, if you've got them secondhand, do you know which manufacturer they're from? I don't, I could ask Clive and, and find out. But the, um, they're, they're not the greatest of figures, but, you know, they're a gift and they're free and, you know, once painted yeah. up, they look all right. So, um, okay. you know, they're meant to be scruffy Irish um, yeah. <laughs> uh, levy, you know, who aren't very well, up, uh, you know, appointed. So, mm. you know, they'll do the job. That's if I ever play Saga again. I haven't played it for ages. Um, yeah, it's just a nice thing to collect armies for, isn't it? But it, it is so long since I played it as well. Right. Yeah. Um, and and still no more. You were just completely done and dusted with those fifteen mil figures until you. I think your next one you said was going to hit the the pikeman or something. The Zeiston was it Zeiston pikeman? No, no. The um, Warren Warren Empire. Warren Empire I've got pikeman. the I've got the pikeman to do, and I've got a bag of um, late. Late Imperial Roman legionaries, and um, then that's that's all the War and Empire stuff done. And after that, I shall have to think what to do. Something um, new. Yeah, I'll I'd, be interesting to know how tough the warlords, the yeah, the War and Empire uh, hands are to drill on there because I think their lead's quite solid on their figures, and it's, I think they might be quite tough to drill. But that's another. Well, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll be. see. It's all I did him with the I did the pikeman, yeah. Um, uh, for the in the first Kickstarter, yeah, and um, they're good. Um, because because they, it's quite hard. Um, yeah. once you're drilling through some of them, when uh, in some manufacturers are a bit softer, it tends to rip up more. Yes, but because they're harder, it was actually uh, nicer. It was a bit hard to get going, right? But once you did, it was quite nice to drill through for putting the pikes in. Yeah. Peter, was that the Battle of Marengo, the picture in, on your background? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay, that could be a thing. So before I come to Simon then, for me, this week was just tidying up and just finishing off the that Hungarian army that I've been wittering on about. Um, so I think two weeks ago we said it would take five or six weeks, but I kind of got and finished off all the cavalry and did quite a bit of photography um, as well over the weekend. So I managed to post you know, 60, 70 pictures of, of all the work in progress that I've been sending to, to some of you folks on, um, on WhatsApp over the, the last few weeks, 
got all that up and and a whole set of photos in the little light box um, as well to do them, finished off their basing, upgraded a couple more. And and I think, Dave, I've, I've actually now worked out what those bowmen are with the weird costumes and things. Um, I think I found some of the pictures actually on the Essex site and it is much more straightforward than, than it looks. They're just kind of wearing a, a kind of padded leather um, yeah, 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 yeah. either a gilet or a, a gilet with short arms um with it so i think yeah. i've just got the bowman and the spears to finish off which i should get done possibly this week um maybe maybe it'll kind of tail into next week and then i have been sort of chewing over what else to do i've got um you know some more bits and pieces to do but but that army is is pretty much done and i did a few more flags i managed to do another um single general because the pack the army pack comes with all the all the heavy knights are in proper kind of metal horse armor that sort of maximilian almost renaissance style apart from three which which are knight proper knights for the generals with all the the clothy stuff and and i managed to do a second one where i glued a paper printed paper design over the um the actual knight um himself or, or over the the um over the cloth look on the plastic thing, which looks okay. Um, and it's got a much tidier pattern, much more detailed pattern than I could ever do myself. Um, I think I upgraded a couple of bases of Merleton medium knights as well, because I think there's some German medium knights that go in, in that army and painted out some more German flags. But it's just really been a, a week of, of just finishing off that army and then trying to start thinking about what to, what to start on after that. Um, a lot of painting in one in two three weeks well you know it, it wasn't it wasn't i think it was it was taking time with the horses but the horses are yeah, yeah. You know, in batches there's there's eight of this one and eight of this one and and then it was sort of finished with army paint so the so i'm just going to open a, a big smoke fruju new england pale ale which i think is a bit british here to do it but so getting the horses done in one go and doing them first really made a difference because then it seemed a lot quicker and yeah. i was yeah, i was just experimenting like line then isn't it and i was just experimenting with the sh with the shield stickers and printing off shields and things and that that was just an interesting thing to do because i was doing something completely new and yeah, those are really get, good the way they came out is brilliant yeah i was really really chuffed mm. with them um with just uh, it's bad news if the little big man shield transfers now that i've realized that you can download um you know non-proprietary images from the internet scale them up print them out and glue them on um, uh, and, one problem with that tim yeah how's simon going to find an excuse to buy another army then well he can just download anything off the internet now and then it's once he just finds something on um, pinterest that's the answer that well, he, he had to build up an army because he got the wrong scale little big man uh, well maybe he presses so. print on the wrong um yeah print on the wrong thing yeah. that could be the answer as well so yeah so they they got done and um and the rest of the stuff's just been sort of staring at me although i did manage to base up a um a kind of a, a an east european type ornate cathedral thing with golden domes on it that was a a souvenir that i picked up in in bulgaria i think um early this year of their main cathedral in, in bulgaria which as long as um, I don't tell the Hungarians, they might just think it's sort of orthodox Christianity, generic East European thing. But I think it's actually the main sort of national cathedral in, in Sofia. So, so that's really what, what I've been focused on this week, painting-wise. So. This means war. Simon, what about what about you? What's been what's been well, the no, no. So the big thing I've been working on this week has been, uh, or last week, has been Seven Years' War Swedish. So I've now um, got all the uh, almost all the mounted painted. And then um, so that's four more battle groups uh, of three bases each of cuirassiers, which all, all look quite good. Five, six artillery pieces, um, four of the uh, limbers, and then I've done three battle groups, uh, each of three bases each, of the skirmisher infantry. So um, they're all, all looking quite good. I've got a few generals as well, so because you always need more management. Yeah, that's been a lot of units then. 
So the skirmish guys, Simon, they're they're in single rank, are they? Yeah, the the skirmishers are in single rank um, on their 30 by 15 basis. And then everybody else is on 30 by 30s. Uh, double, double ranked rank, yeah. with um, yeah. regimental guns and banners and all that. That, that. That's how it works in King of the Battlefield, yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I did something um, uh, very different for a Wargamer. I read the rules and looked at the, what the basic requirement was. <laughs> what, before buying but, the figures? That's heresy. Heresy. There are really no, fun set of rules to play. I've never had a bad game of it. Sold. Mm-hmm. Um, is, is that other limbers in that army painted a particular colour, or they, is it just a, a brown wooden limber era? Um, I've gone for something a little bit prettier. So I've gone for the limbers are like a an olive green type of, of colour, <laughs> and then the artillery are a um, deeper blue with nice with red wheels and stuff like that, and big brass um, brass cannons and all that, just to uh, make it a bit more bright, of a brighter army, especially when you. If we ever get back to the pub, playing in a well-lit pub, you need yeah. all the um, highlighting you can get. All the brightness and colour that you can get. Yeah. Well, <coughs> fingers crossed that's the case. And I think that that brings us neatly on to um, the discussion of, of what gaming people have done this week. Bit of music, bit of music. Right. So who's been looking around it? Um, anybody want to wave? Tell us about any games that they've played this week. Um, Adam, you're you're first up. You're doing a little wave. This is um. Have you beaten the kids this week? Or metaphorically, no, no, in, in don't the game use get to beat the kids. Um, I've, I've done. I did a solo game. Do you know, I said I was painting those World War Two ships. Hmm. I did a solo game with uh, General Quarters Three, um, just with three ships. It was like a big Japanese heavy cruiser and a not so good British one, light cruiser, a sort of like Graf Spey type. Um, scenario just to test the rules to see if I could follow them and um, it's a complicated enough game to make it interesting but well enough designed to make it really quite quick and easy so I um, really enjoyed that and now I'm going to um, do um, all the battles of the of the Save Our Island campaign, uh, Solomon Islands campaign um, <laughs> and that's something I'm intending to do solo because um, just as an interesting telling a story type thing, so it's, um, I'm all geared up to do that now. It's quite good. Are there books Apparently, about every song? American cruiser which took part in that campaign was either sunk or badly damaged. Yeah, it's um, it's it's kind of it was when the Japanese and U.S. Navy's second half of 1942, when there was equilibrium. Yeah, um, most of the battles were at night, and the Japanese were better at fighting at night. Um, and it was just sort of like fairly brutal battles. So well, the Americans um, would find the Japs on the radar, wouldn't they? The American, Japanese would say, "Bloody hell, what's in this? Lob off some uh, long lance torpedoes and bugger off, and you know, sink a few American ships on the way." Well, no, it's was, it was even weirder than that because the Americans thought they were better at, better at fighting at night because they had radar. Um, yeah, but they didn't realise that the Japanese had spent the last twenty years figuring out how to fight at night, so the Japanese were better. And the Americans would, I read um, one of the battles, I read the official um, United States Navy write-up. And the story was, it's sort of, they think the Japanese are coming into an ambush. Mm. And they open fire, and they all fire at the first Japanese ship, which explodes in about a minute, just gets overwhelmed. And all the other Japanese ships turn away and run. Um, and the sort of like official report says that this order, the, uh, the, that this time the order for pursuit was given. Um, and then there's just a brilliant um, sentence in this report because the next sentence was, it was at this point the torpedoes start hitting. Um, <laughs> and the Americans thought the Japanese were coming into an ambush, but the Japanese optics were so good, they knew the Americans were there. So they just launched torpedoes. And when they turned and turned and ran away, they weren't running away. They were going back to base because they had already won. It just took well, the Americans don't... a couple of minutes to find out. Yeah. Um, and they all so it's kind of like interesting stuff going on. Wasn't it the American torpedoes just were not very good at that point in the war as well? Well, they yeah, they were as bad as the submarine ones. The American torpedoes didn't work. Um, they ran too deep, and they used a magnetic exploder because they thought that was a good idea. Everybody in the 30s thought a magnetic exploder was a good idea, but everyone apart from the Americans figured out that they were just too unreliable. Um, so it would go under the ship and not explode. And the American torpedoes were appalling. The Japanese torpedoes were excellent. The American torpe- the Japanese torpedoes were so good that the 
the Americans couldn't figure out what was happening. And in all the official American reports, they're sort of like they're writing reports of motor torpedo boats around or submarines because they couldn't figure out how they kept being torpedoed. And they just couldn't think it was the Japanese torpedoes from the destroyers doing it because they were far too far away for a torpedo to get that far. So, um, so it took them a while. The Americans figured out in the end and they ended up winning and sort of like advancing. Um, but yeah, no, it's an interesting little series of battles, which I'm not sure how interesting they would be to play as a one-on-one -on -one game, competitive game, but as a sort of series of solo games to watch the story unfold as opposed to mm. um, playing competitively, it would be quite interesting, I think. So you, are you sort of learning about the history by playing the battle and going, ah, oh, I'd see why they did that because... Um, not so I kind of know about the history and yeah. I like toy soldiers so I thought yeah. I would play the game as yeah. play the game as well and I've got I've, it's like I've, been, I've got all the models so I might as well actually use the bloody things to be perfectly honest yeah, the Japanese yeah. torpedo Japanese destroyers are nice looking ships aren't they um, they are but when they're one six thousand scale uh, oh one six thousand uh, yeah that's a bit yeah um, yeah. So is this is this like sub kitchen table? You know, is this top of biscuit tin? One six. Well, no. Yeah. World War Two naval games. It's you can still do it on a six by four table, and at that small scale, that's kind of big enough right. because people shot so far, not so much at night. That if you want a chance to maneuver and play before, because a lot of naval games I've played in the past, sort of people have put the ships on the table. And they're close enough that you're shooting at each other on turn one. So, in effect, it's a die rolling competition, really. Um, so, yeah, I went for a very small scale. So, if you want a big game, you can split the fleets up. Um, split the fleets, fleets up. But most of these games will be um, night games, which um, were just murderous because it yeah. was all at very, very short range. You've probably got um, about a dozen ships at most on each side. Yeah, and a um, dozen ships each side. They're not very far apart. And I remember someone describing the night battles as um, 12 people in a dark room, each with a gun, and someone strikes a match and everyone starts shooting. <laughs> <laughs> I, read, I read something once where they, 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 this was a, a wildlife program where they were looking at the reefs around Guadalcanal and some of the ships had become bases for coral and you know yeah. uh, fish and stuff like that. And they said they trying to track the position of the ships by reference to the logs in the battle. And the one consistent factor was that no ship sank at the position where it should have been according to its log. Yeah, no, it was, it was all... I mean, it, and it was just... Because um, there was the first battle, the Battle of Savo Island, where the uh, Japanese just completely did over the Americans and there were some Australians as well. There was one bit where the Australian cruiser um, was brought up and she was torpedoed on one side and that's why she sank. Or well, it wasn't brought up, divers went down to it. And they also discovered that there were torpedo hits on the other side as well. So American ships were just going, oh, fire. And it's just like, <laughs> they, they hit the wrong ship. And it was all just like, yeah, quite humorous. And uh, I'm glad I wasn't there sort of way. <laughs> is that I, one of the ones where they were eaten by sharks as well? Or is that a different series? That was the Indianapolis, when, after they delivered the atom bomb to the base where they flew it off from. In 1945. Yeah, they, weren't allowed, they weren't allowed to radio their positions. That's why they all got eaten. Ah, okay. It's a right. secret because they delivered the bombs. They couldn't tell anybody where they were. Yeah. What, what, what did the Japs do about it by then anyway? Nothing, I suppose. Exactly. From Jules. Yeah. <laughs> possibly, possibly. So uh, anybody else played a game? Andy, I think you played a... Oh, sorry. Just oh, sorry, there's more. There's more. One more thing. Just a yeah. quick shout because it's brilliant. A few games of Exploding Kittens. Yes, which yes, um, yes. everyone should do on a regular basis. To be perfect, everyone honest. should do. Yeah, that that should be something we should do on um, tabletop simulator. I'm sure they must have exploding <laughs> kittens on that. That could be a thing. This means war. Andy, you've played a game as well. I think you've played the, um, the legend, the man, the legend that is Rafa Tortosa. Indeed. Well, I played two games of, uh, on this uh, ADLG-friendly international league. 
um, on Tabletop Simulator. I played Ollie Tyler on yeah. Thursday night, and uh, I won that one by eating his camp, and uh, he very kindly charged some hoplites up, uphill into some impact swordsmen and an elephant, and that didn't go too well for him. What were the two armies for that one? I was using Carthaginian, he was using um, Classical Greek. Yeah, because I think he's just made a load of Classical Greek armies, hasn't he, in um, in in the sort of 3D models. Um, are they all, I've not looked at them yet, have they got nice shields and things like that, is it? Yeah, it's quite, quite nice, they've got different shield patterns, and the elite heavy spear spartan ones have got the lambda quite distinctly on on, on the shield Brilliant. yeah okay um and then yesterday i played rafa and um i was using carthaginians again i was trying out a new list for hopefully for warfare if it ever happens so that we have to have two elephants in that so i couldn't have hannibal in italy but i have hannibal before he went to italy um so uh and rafa was using um I think Seleucids. Seleucids. And uh, he had 24 what, units. Pardon? As always uses Seleucids. Is yeah, that his so classic had... hugely huge army with bits and bobs and, and a bit of everything everywhere? He had 24 units in his army and he had um, all of his generals were ordinary and they were all embedded in elite units. Okay, that's maybe a different way of doing it then. So, Because um, I've seen it before when he has like two two big commands of... of every type of foot there is in the world and a, and a rubbish elephant and then yeah. sort of a smaller command of cataphracts and and a couple of rubbish cavalry i think was was it is that the way we've seen it dave um I, i've never been good enough to play rafa in those sort of oh, it's okay <laughs> well it was slightly different the one ripped off that we did in doubles yes that's the one we ripped off and copied in doubles yeah i think that's good yeah day. seemed to work yeah <laughs> yeah he had he had one rubbish elephant in in, in in a sort of mixed infantry command and then on one wing he had um again a, a pikeman and a, a a general and a pike uh heavy infantry and um the video two spent two smelly camels and a, a a light cavalry unit and my punic cavalry eventually turned them over and then made a grab for his camp and i was kind of behind the curve for most of the game but fortunately um with, with the aid of a 5-1 when in one particular combat, which stopped the unit dying, but just got badly mangled, uh, I had enough time to uh, take his camp and chase a few units off the board before that particular unit died. Brilliant. So is that your third game on Tabletop Simulator then? Oh, third on, sim third on Simulator, one against you, yeah. and then two competition games. But, Good. Um, and, you, and you're starting to feel it's, it's just like playing a game. It's not... Um, are you kind of getting used to it, or...? I think so. I, th I think the, I think the um, well, a couple of key things. One, I think, is get your army list organised and remember to put a camp in there before mm. you start playing. <laughs> um, the other thing is, I think the method of communication between the players has a um, bearing on how long the game takes. Because when you and I played, we were literally chatting, you know, verbally, yeah. and there was no d delay. Rafa, because his, I, I phoned him up on WhatsApp, but he said, "Look, his English isn't good enough. Could I?" send him whatsapp messages and even though we were messaging fairly quickly um it did actually take a bit longer and i think that slowed the game down considerably now I'm blaming him because his yeah. english is far better than my spanish but you know i think it's just you know the method of communication between the players does have a bearing on the yeah. length of time the game takes yeah well dave your your spanish is obviously perfect isn't it now you can say um, <laughs> Valencia or something. I, I know um, Spears and okay. Lanciere or something. <laughs> and I know okay. uh, Pavelinos. Pavelinos is very important. Pavelinos, uh, indeed. Uh, Impactos. Impactos. That's Impactos is a very important piece of Spanish. For you, that's it. you know the word for army in Spanish? Uh, I, I think that's the extent of my Spanish. Right. Yeah, when, if you're playing Rafa, it's always Seleucid. Is the, well, is we've for army. Like, why is he throwing his toys across the room? Yeah. <laughs> no, I was throwing the toys across the room. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll freely admit I, I have played no games this week, but I think um, Andy's missed one thing that's quite important out about his game against Rafa. Mm. So I'll, I'll oh. feed back to Rafa. I'll feed back to Andy for the last comment on what his game on Rafa. Oh yes, well I think I, I think he's um, uh, definitely done a central <laughs> London moment in part of the game because uh, at one point he was sending me a message about an attack he was doing with his pikeman saying right I'm three up in this one 
and I'm attacking you in the flank. And I looked and he was attacking this swordsman unit. And I said, Raphael, that's a heavy swordsman unit. I don't have any in my army. As he was purporting to attack his own unit. In the flank? Yes. Uh, all right, okay. So you would be identical struck. basing then. That's the problems with identical basing and digital yeah, we like troops. That story. We think that's really good. Yeah, we scrubbed the hits, of course, but it was still a funny yeah. thing to see. That was a bold tactic. Did it work out for him? Yes. This is the best player <laughs> in Europe, this is. <laughs> An <laughs> easy mistake to make. <laughs> I, I was delighted to scrape a draw against him. <laughs> no, that's the result. And, um, anybody else had a, a game this week? Um, nobody. Um, just me then. Uh, so I, I again had a part of this online friendly league for ADLG and um, and I played a chap from the States, Paul, who who I was supposed to do doubles with at Cold Wars earlier on this um, earlier on this year in my last overseas trip, but um, he he ended up not coming. I think his his wife um, I was going to say put a gun to his head, but it's America, so that's possibly true. Um, <laughs> yeah, t- told him um, that in no uncertain terms that um, his his age and general health precluded him from going anywhere um, at all at the time at which um, world of lockdown was starting to creep in quite quickly as I think was the case for a lot of people who were supposed to go to Cold War so so I never actually met him and um, but now I've met him and played him online and um, and we had a game in this sort of friendly the friendly tabletop league a transatlantic game on Sunday afternoon and, and I was kind of giving a run out to sort of Hugh Bear's German army the, the early Germans, all those impetuous elite heavy foot, and then sort of two big mobs of elite medium cavalry on on one wing, and um, in a in a classical period, and um, and I think I, I actually I, I told him I was going to use the Germans, and then he picked the the Gauls as an army that he doesn't normally use, um, and I think it's so we ended up with almost a mirror match. So he had lots of heavy infantry, impetuous swordsmen. Um, to match off mine, but he had a few more because his were kind of mixed average and elite. And then on the wings, we both had loads of medium cavalry and a couple of heavies. And um, and again, he had, I think, more than me because his were ordinary and, and mine were all elite. And um, and the two armies just lined up identically <laughs> and, and slammed into each other. We we got a waterway down as well um, to make it even, even less dynamic. And... Um, eventually numbers numbers and dice um told against quality irritatingly i think i kind of messed up by by trying to be slightly over clever and, and split up my, my big command of heavy infantry which meant they sort of went in in two waves when they probably were just best off lining up and advancing and, and trying to minimize overlaps so i didn't need to do anything clever um but, but i think towards the end i was i was one away um in my last turn um, from breaking and I think I needed to get about six of his army and and they had a heroic effort to do it and I got five of them so um, I think his army was what was his army I think his army was 27 and I got 26 of them and, and mine was 24 and, and that went down as well but you know again once we got up and running on on tabletop simulator it was it was just a normal straightforward game actually um, it, it worked kind of well I think um, and the, the Germans it's an army that a bit like the um the the galatian army that um i i took to where was it a bournemouth last year wasn't it um it kind of works because it's a bit left field and it's a bit of a surprise and and it catches more textbook classical armies off balance but 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 if it if you know it's coming that um that that ability to catch you off balance you can kind of brace yourself so so that didn't quite work out as well but I'm definitely going to fit in some more games over the next couple of weeks with with that. I think um, I've got to take some holiday from work as well to try and fit some holiday in this this half of the year. So that may well fit in a few more games um, during the day as well as, as stuff sort of gets gets eased up. So so I think that's probably um, about about it for the game of, for the week of gaming. This means war. chat with each other when you're playing on cts a couple of choices best thing is yeah. the in-game chat thing you can just speak to each other without doing anything extra right is yeah, that video game. chat or just audio chat or just t- audio or yeah. Video. yeah there's audio chat 
it, it's a bit oh. fiddly to find it and set it up. You've got to go in and switch it on, but it's once you've done that, it's it just works. I can never remember it's where it's quite good quality as well. Yeah, yeah it's and have you decent. all mast have you all mastered how to move groups and things now? Yeah, kind yeah. of wheeling nope. all sorts of stuff, but. But if you're just lining them up and go forwards, it's straightforward. So that was the bit think, we found difficult at first, and I, that sort of like gave me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> no, it becomes a lot easier. I think I'm. Pick I'm, armies um, where you're just going straight forward, then, Dave. Like Galatians and yeah, and Germans, yeah. That's yeah. the secret. Yeah, I think me and yeah. Simon are going to have a, a kind of run through tomorrow evening at some point, um, just to, to have a look at it. So well, I'm going to give Andy a game on Wednesday. So we, and if I can get there, I'll. Yeah, we'll go for it. So it's now that time of the week for um, our foray into the murky world of the Napoleonic Wars in um, our second, again, I suspect increasingly popular theme tuned, um, and it's the theme tune that's popular, not the feature, of, of um, teaching Timmy about Napoleon. <laughs> So last week on on this feature, we kind of got to, as always seems to be the case with this, um, in my ongoing education from from everyone else around the screen, a slightly weird thing in that Napoleon had decided the best way to irritate the British was to go to Egypt and had fought a series of disastrously unsuccessful battles against the British and then had gone home to France a hero. Um, and, and that's sort of where it ended. Um, and, and there was something about being one of the top people in France, or of, of which there were three or something. But but so he's, he's, he won battles before and went home a hero, and got promoted. Now he lost battles and went home a hero, which which I can see as if that's a skill of yours, that's probably destined you for great leadership, um, no matter what you do in, in life, that's kind of successful. But so he's uh, you know asking the room again. So Napoleon's gone back. He's um, He's got rid of the the Cairo runs or whatever they're called, um, the, the pyramid trots. And he's now back in Paris eating his croissants. He's got his bicorn hat on at this time, I imagine, because I, I think that's an early sort of revolutionary wars thing. France is full of revolutionary fervor. They kick most people around, um, but I imagine they're still surrounded by people who'd rather they, they had a king and stuff. So, so what, how did he end up a hero when he went back? Was it just good PR? Yes. Well, partly, okay. but he also did win some battles. I mean, he did he did effectively take over Egypt militarily. Despite losing. He's, well, he, 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 he lost, lost, he lost uh, against uh, the British. Well, he, won, and then, he won against the Egyptians, and then he lost against the British. But that was a naval thing. And land. Where did he lose? I mean, yeah, okay. Acre, Siege of Acre, basically. But that oh, was because okay. yeah. it was an English yeah. officer. Sydney Smith, with, uh, Acre. With Sydney Smith, that's right, yeah. He'd but also been asked happen? to return home anyway. So it's not like he was running back. He'd been sent several messages to come home anyway to help them. But by the time he got there, France had had a couple of victories. So he turned up and said, um, you know, it, it was good time for him to turn up anyway. Okay, so he, he, so he was winning a bit against the mighty, mighty Egyptian army. Then the French said, come back home for some reason, which we're yet to find out. And, but the letters took quite a long time, lockdown post, all that sort of stuff. He probably lost a couple of battles while the, it was lost in the mail. And then thought, I'd better get back before they realise I've lost. So what was he going back for then? What, what did they need him for? Well... They were fighting against um, all the rest of Europe at the time, but they managed to pull still, off the still. But they, yes. well, the, the, it's an ongoing thing for the next of like 15 years, really. Um, but uh, Republic was bankrupt, um, but his brother was the Speaker of They're the House. They're financing all these expeditions to Egypt that bankrupt Exactly. It, so his brother and buddy were, you know, Speaker of the House and um, uh, guys in charge. And so they brought him in and uh, basically... Uh, uh, changed over the uh, directorate, basically. Okay, so so when he went back and was hailed a hero, it, he was hailed a hero by his brother and his best mate, who was sort of running the government. Pretty much. Right. 
but he'd beaten the Austrians before. So they mm-hmm. presumably were back in their little box in Vienna. So who else was having a go at him at the time? Well, the well, Russians had them as well. They, 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 yeah, the, Austrians, the Austrians and the Russians and the British. I, came, I were, came back and, well, the Austrians came back with the Russians this time and were having a go at him in northern Italy. We're doing and quite it's, well. But hadn't the Austrians like been you know, put back in their box and done some sort of peace treaty. Did they just cheat? Yeah, they got out of the box again. Yeah. All right, okay. They clambered out of the box, the Austrians. And brought the Russians with them. And brought the Russians to Northern Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, the Russians decided they wanted to invade Switzerland, funnily enough. Is that closer to... I guess that's closer to Russia than Northern Italy. Uh, Well, the Russian army split into two parts. One part went into Italy, one part went into Switzerland. Because... Were there countries... had invaded Switzerland... Were there countries in the way, like, you know, those sort of ukraine type places, or was it just all Russia at that time? Was it one of those? Was I, so all the way to Poland was part of Russia at that, that time. Ah, oh, okay. Right, so well, Russia can, was next to Switzerland by then. And also Who wants to explain to Tim place. about the three partitions of Poland? That would be fun. Yeah. No, no, no. because don't forget that they, they no. were basically allowed to go through Austria because they were Austria's allies. When we talk about Austria, we're talking about the Habsburg Empire. So yeah. It's all the Austro-Hungarian yeah. Which covered a large part of Poland. Ah, yeah. I now under... Right, so it's not Austria. Poland like, had been split of... three ways. And yeah, we're talking like, about the Habsburg... Russia, Russia and Austria. Yeah. Right. So Austro-Hungarian the Empire got was pretty big then. Got you. So, the, so it's not... When we're saying Austria, that's just shorthand for the... Austro-Hungarian Empire, Empire which yeah. Would, yeah. would cover all those little other places in the middle of the country. So it wasn't just schnitzel, it was more... goulash and all sorts of things. Yeah. 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 Austria, Austria, Hungary, Slavia, 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 Bulgaria. <coughs> so Spain, basically, the, at this time, the Austro-Hungarian army could have had its own sort of version of Euro 1794 or something, with, yeah. with two groups yeah. of eight and seeding, quarterfinals, semifinals, all, all that yeah. sort of thing. Possibly even a Two groups, you know, four groups of four. Their own song they could have their own song contest. contest. Paint them. Yeah. Have you ever heard Henning Vang explain about timing in comedy? He yes. did a joke and he said that uh, he was. Go- he told a friend that he was going to watch a football match and his friend asked him who he was playing. And the friend said, uh, Austria Hungary. And he said, um, Really? Who are they playing against? Which a hundred years ago would have been a funny joke. A a so funny that's joke. why his timing is important in comedy. <laughs> it's getting better when he does it, but quite unique. It it's good. I'm glad Maggie you didn't also, do it. Other really good joke is he's asked what British team he supports, and he says Coventry. So. So we're back to this. So we know that it's the Austro-Hungarians, which makes it a lot more understanding why their friends, the Russians, were able to get to Switzerland. So the Russians fancy a bit of Switzerland. Invading Switzerland's always been a bit tricky, but they're having a go at that. And they're also in Italy again. So Napoleon presumably is there with his mates in Paris, having got really good PR and dodged out of Egypt before losing. And he's kind of like, bloody hell, I've got to go give the Austrians a kick in the end. Is that... Oh, is that where we're at? So, well, kind of, yeah. Basically, things things went. The French did have an army in Italy, but things went fairly disastrously for it, and Napoleon had to go down and try and rescue the situation. Um, the Alps. And there was also a falling out between the Austrians and the Russians, because Russians thought that thought that the reason the campaign, I the aim of the campaign, was to beat the French up. Right. Whereas the Austrians thought it was about gaining territory, well, regaining and gaining territory. So there's a big falling out between Suvorov, who is in Italy with, with the Russian corps and the Austrians, and Suvorov had been kicking French butt. Right. And you, uh, I should point out that at this time, the Russian army was essentially wearing Prussian Seven Years' War uniforms, different colours, but... Seven years okay. war uniforms. So. so they're in second-hand clothes, these Russians, but they're giving the French a kicking. Um, yeah. But but did the Russians really expect to hold territory in Italy with sort of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the way? 
They must. They must. No, they, 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 they Russians, Russians, like, Russians went into it not aiming to, without any territorial ambition. Their main yeah. ambition was to become, was pretty much like in the Seven Years' War, about becoming a influent, a major right. political influence in in Europe. Okay. Um, and so, so they also the, wants to beat up the French. But weren't these two, you know, things aligned? Because if you're Russia and there's the Austro-Hungarian Empire in between you and Northern Italy, and you go there, well, I'm going to go Russia there. Russia was French quite point. happy with the territories it had. Yeah, but but wouldn't the Austrians who were working with them go, all right, so you beat up the French, we beat up the French, and, and then you go home and we'll just kind of stay here and build some holiday homes and things? Um, did, the, did the Russians start to object to the fact the Austrians were starting to open schnitzel houses in northern Italy or something? No, the objection well, is the fact the Austrians weren't feeding them. They didn't them. want to carry on fighting. They didn't want to c carry on pushing the French. Ah, right. The Austrians had had enough. They thought we'd yeah. got enough. Then there was... We'd got the ski slopes. All we're all... Diplomacy, diplomatic interventions, and Suvarov basically got told, no, you're going, you're going to Switzerland. <laughs> Okay, you're going back to Switzerland to meet up with the other Russian army. Yeah, I think to be fair, you said you thought you thought bugger this, I'm off, and the only way home was via Switzerland, and so he had to fight his way through Switzerland because it was now full of French troops. Yeah, right. Because the other so, friend, the other the other Russian corps had Russian general, corps Prince of army, but it's got seriously stomped. Yes, seriously stomped. Okay, so 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 and then. By the way, it's winter. Of course, it's winter. Yeah. That's the time to go through Switzerland, isn't it? That's top of your list if you're on yeah. foot in an Steve army Rob and stuff like that. Made it through. He be, he won just about every encounter. It on were, his were, there, were there elephants involved? If people are crossing the Alps in winter, no, no. artillery. Artillery involved. The artillery okay. up and so the, the French are in Switzerland, stopping the Russians going home after the Russians have given them a bloody nose in Italy, yeah. and. And the Russians are only going home through Switzerland because their former friends, the Austro-Hungarians, they've fallen out with them because the Austro-Hungarians got bored with beating up the French. So then the Russians decide yeah. to go home, go through Switzerland and bump into a load of French people who instead of going, you've just beaten us up in Italy, we will step aside, please go home, um, say, let's have a go. And then they get pasted as well. So the Russians are kind of giving everybody a kicking all over anywhere well, where you well, go well, skiing. No, I, I don't think it's fair to say the French got a kicking every battle because they, um, they, they won a big battle at Zurich. I can't remember if that was against Suvorov yeah, or the was, other guy. That was against Suvorov, though, was it? So basically the French were falling back in good order. Yeah. Until so Napoleon turned up on the scene and they went, let's go for him. Right. And, and he was just like, right, let's have, a, let's have a go at this because we don't like falling well, back in Switzerland. Well, also, and, Napoleon had just announced himself as first consul, so he's like going, yeah, I'm in a dodgy position politically, unless I do something spectacular and do it soon, um, I spy a guillotine coming my way. So he basically turned around and well, went... Even from his brother? Yeah, well, his brother would be alongside him <laughs> on oh. a guillotine. A <laughs> um, family so, guillotine. Well, yeah, that's what was happening at the time, you know, two for ones. Right. So <laughs> okay. they basically turned around and went, Okay, we're going to do something about this and do something pretty sharpish. And, and how did, where, time, where and when did he do that? Was this was this a battle whose name I might have heard of? Yeah, well, by this time the Russian the, the Russians had cleared off, so Napoleon was going so he had to. No one left to fight. Italy. No, there's all the, the Austrians. Austrians to fight. Oh, oh sorry. So something about so the Russians are trying to go home through Switzerland to avoid the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They beat the French people who were there and break through, and then Napoleon goes. I will go there and stop them, but they've no, all no, gone. The Napoleon, no, no, Napoleon, Napoleon went this is, to, this is winter. to do the Austrians. So, so the, the Russians had got home then, yes. and they'd broken through. Well, some of them, Napoleon, they left a lot of guys behind. Right. And then Napoleon's going, right, I need to do something for my own political base in Paris. So who's available? The Russians have already gone home, and they're quite good. I've kicked the Austrians already. They look like top of the list of easy meat. So they happen to be in Italy, which we want back, yeah. And they want back Italy, yeah. Right, okay. so um, there's this famous picture, you've probably seen it, of Napoleon crossing the Alps. By David. With an elephant, no? No, no not with an elephant. Not with the horse. horse rearing up. Yeah, picture by... The famous thing is Napoleon crossed the Alps with his artillery. As Nap so it, it was very much modelled on Hannibal, 
but the story is that Napoleon got his troops to put the guns on sleds and cross the Alps with his artillery and that made all the difference. And then the very famous French painter called David pictured Napoleon crossing the Alps with his artillery and as Pete says, on a rearing horse. And that's kind of the beginning of the Napoleon myth because at this point he's the first consul, as we said, and it's now becoming less about the revolution and more about Napoleon as a personality. Okay. So it's Napoleon on the white horse where it's all rearing up. That's a very famous painting. It's the white horse in the snow. Okay. There you go. That's it. That's it. Yeah. There we go. Good painting. All right. The horse is yeah, so, in the original. Yeah, he, he, oh, this is the, this is the picture thing. where he looks like a, a you know a, a stylish and cool, handsome man when yeah. actually he was like a short bloke with a chip on his shoulder. No, he's quite young and cool then. And he wasn't right. that short. He wasn't that short. He was five foot seven. Yeah. He was exactly. actually above average for French. So he'd look down on Dave. Yeah, right. right, okay. <laughs> Dave's the only person he could look down on. You're not seeing okay. time bandits. So, so basically he's, he's had another go at the Austrians and to stop himself getting his head chopped off. And he's had to imitate Hannibal to do so. And he's done it with sleds and guns. Yes. So he's in Northern Italy. He's taking these things over the thing. He's got a load of guns together because that's his shtick. That's what he does. He's beating the Austrians because they're a bit rubbish and they panic whenever he see him. Well, well really, he, in fact, he knew he lost a battle. One that's behind me. That's the Battle mm. of uh, uh, Marengo, where uh, he's got twenty-four thousand troops and the Austrians have got thirty thousand, but the Austrians decide to advance into mass guns. Not a smart move. So basically, the French great. mow them down. Well, well, that is a battle that the chicken mill's named after, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The chicken mill. Yeah. Chicken yeah. Marengo. Marengo chicken. So what's? Well, I, I don't even know anything about the food. What's chicken Marengo? Is, is this a, a big part of Napoleonic dish. history I know nothing about? I think it's a it's a chicken breast stuffed with garlic, or is that that's that's Vienna or something? <laughs> uh, no, that's, 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 that's Kiev. Kiev. That's Kiev. Yeah, same difference. So, what's chicken marengo then? Does anyone know? I, I, I think it's made. I've, I've not exhausted something. your knowledge of the Napoleonic Wars, have I? When it comes to cooking, no, no. Okay, so that's the, that's the ex exercise yeah. for next week. Is so this is June eighteen hundred. So it's a summer meal. It's a salad, yeah, possibly. It's a sun and summer meal. No, it's not and a warm thing. It's not a stew the... with dumplings or anything, no. Yeah. Austrian chicken marengo uh, is a French dish consisting of a chicken sautéed in oil with garlic and tomato, garnished with fried eggs and crayfish. Fried eggs? What? Fried eggs and crayfish? <laughs> That's brilliant. That's astonishing. Uh, Why have I never eaten that? <laughs> Why have you never eaten it? Sounds ludicrous. That's that's like that's like ready steady cook, isn't it? Basically, yeah, what have you got in the fridge? <laughs> We've got a crayfish. He's got a mystery bag. <laughs> so clearly, they weren't expecting to win this battle. They win it. He goes back yeah. to his staff chef and goes, "Make me a special uh, dish to celebrate this victory." And the bloke looks in the fridge and goes, "Shit!" Precise. Yes, this is this is the thing. Yeah, Fried you know. eggs. It is polo marango. His chef because, Dinon foraged in the town for ingredients because the supply wagons were too distant and created the dish from what he could gather. Uh, clearly, yeah. So it literally <laughs> was ready, steady cook yeah, but in the Napoleonic couple Wars. A couple of crayfish in the uh, barrel, sir. Uh, Fantastic. North. So we've got the ready, steady cook in the Napoleonic Wars. And this, after this, he's, he's done this. He's invented the world's maddest food. And... Um, and I think probably before we even get to the dessert stage, that's probably a good time to stop this episode. Um, and and we'll, we'll return with more culinary adventures of Napoleon. Just week. before we stop, I've got to say that after three episodes of teaching Timmy about Napoleonics, I now understand it less than I did three <laughs> weeks ago. <laughs> I, I think that's partly the aim of this, partly. But, but I've got to know more about the food. The crazy stuff, yeah. I'm, I'm glad my questioning is helping bring out some a, a new dimension of it. Yeah. And, um, there is there is a lovely just, just one little little vignette. There's a, a lovely um, memoirs of a French squaddy, and I think his name is Elazar Blaise, and he talks about you know life Jean in the French Army during no? Pardon? Jean de Crevette? No. 
No, his name is Elazar Blaise, but okay. he talks about your know, life as a French squaddy and he says, you know, in terms of looking after people, he says, if you get a guy in your squad who can cook, you look after him. You don't let him do guard duty. You don't put him in the front line. You don't let him die. He said, the tenants, yeah, they come and go. They're ten a penny. If you're off to die, nobody cares. But, you know, cooks need to be guarded. And But clearly, they obviously couldn't find one when they were trying to cobble together the chicken merengue. Because <laughs> that's just random. Maybe it's someone stoned. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you for that week's learnings. Um, we've, we've gone quite digressed. And which way round are their hats still now? Are their hats left or right? Triangular? Across, I think. Still still cross. Cross. The uh, Shaco doesn't come in until after Italy. Fine. We're still in, we're still in like bicorn hats bicorn. then. Good. Yeah. Still that's all yeah. I need to know. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and one auxiliary bow. Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? So I might have to lose a skirmisher or something. You kind of went out of point if you do that, Adam. Yeah, well, no, it's, it should be. It's got to be heavy cavalry, Tim. Okay. So it's, uh, two points. Uh, the um, auxiliary would have to come down to ordinary. One of them will. Yeah. So the three auxiliary, one of them elite. Um, there's also a bowman, and this command's got quite a lot of different moving parts. Um, to do it basically, um, you've got two lumps of foot. You're illegal now, aren't you? No. Not if you drop one of the auxiliary from elite to ordinary. No, but for number of cavalry. No. Why is that illegal? No, because you can take two of them as, as um, goth cavalry. That's okay, yeah. Yeah, oh, two of the, the barbarians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, of the, um, two of the heavy cavalry impact of Foderati. Right, got you. Um, so, and yeah, the first command again, it's got cataphracts, it's got auxilia, it's got heavy cavalry, it's got archers um, with a strategist. So there's a mounted lump and there's a foot lump, um, which you can use like that because three medium swordsman impact supported by a bowman is good in a rough. And then um, elite cataphracts, heavy cavalry, some light horse as well, and that can be useful. But this command's the toolkit command. Um, because you can do lots of different things with it. If the opponents have got lots of light horse on that wing, you can move the archers out wide to support your light horse and chase them off. The cataphracts can fight the enemy cavalry or it can come inside and support the legionaries because three legionaries on their own isn't that scary, but three legionaries with two of the cataphracts next to them and then three medium swordsman impact next to that is getting quite right wide um and the whole point of this army is it poses a lot of questions to the opposition and it's got answers to more or less anything the opposition can throw at it having a strategist gives that first command enough command points to do what it needs to do and is also useful for messing around with terrain um, the drawback of this army is I think it will be quite effective, but I would need to practice an awful lot with it before I got effective with it, <laughs> because I think it would be quite a hard army to use and it would need practice. Um, once that practice was done, I think it would be quite useful because I can't think, too, think of too many in period armies that I would think I can't handle this with this army. Um, so yeah, it's that classic um, toolkit can do lots of different things as needed type army. Yeah, I, you can, you can, well, it's, it's absolutely a toolkit, isn't it? Um, with, with all those different bits. I'm, I mean, for instance, um, usually the legionaries would probably go in the middle with the two wing commands, but I would quite actually quite like to use this army with the waterway, anchor it on the Rhine or the Danube, um, and the legionaries go next to the waterway with the artillery shooting, and then just all the mounted troops and the medium foot mess around in the open bit it can be used in many different ways and i think it's got answers to most things it's it's kind of really close to having an initiative of four though isn't it you've got so is it the strategist is two the yeah, competence just, plus just, one. Needs to, just needs two more two more light light horse either two more light horse which might be too many or yeah. um or upgrade you know one of the generals again because then you'd have an initiative of four to give you even more chance of of lurching forwards and um the um, you've got four, the you've got four light horse which, you've got four light horse which is is sometimes either you know i can see what they do sort of but it's sometimes that's either neither fish nor fowl isn't it it's it's not two and it's not six i know but they they do the jobs in this sort of like first command it skirmishes in a flank and they can be yep. supported um, and in the middle command, it can skirmish out what's going on. So I did think about getting to Initiative 4, and it might be possible to include the competent general with the heavy cavalry impact, because he's not doing too many different things. So that might be a thing forward. But then again, having that flexibility, um, yeah, having that flexibility might be good, because uh, so I suppose a minor tweak like that could work, but... It gives is you a lot of one initiative generals, point, doesn't it? Yeah, is one initiative point huge? And in yeah. some ways, the last command that I've got as ordinary doesn't really need to be competent. No. Um, so you're you spending can't afford points to lose him, can't you? Really? Yeah. You're okay. spending points just for that one yeah. initiative point. So, uh, yeah, that, that might be a thing. I'm not sure. Yeah. 
Dave, you, Dave, you've used similarish armies to this. What's um? I, I, I mean, I, I like. I mean, it's my favourite sort of historical period and my favourite army. But I think it, it really. I mean, it, there's an overall problem with this army, which is the Roman legionaries in period as well get thumped by cataphracts. And I agree with Adam that he's got the cataphract elite into the first command to support the, the legionaries. But I feel the legionaries are always at a bit of a disadvantage. I, I think they are, but you've got to army. have them. I think that um, weakens the army in, in itself, in its total. I think the one interesting thing you can do with the legionaries is almost treat them as, um, treat them as you can actually treat them as um, terrain troops. Because although they're heavy infantry and they get a minus one in terrain, they're still um, impact and they're still very good. So you can actually use, say, right, the legionaries are just not afraid of um, terrain and they're going to sail through any terrain that's available. And I think, I th I mean. think they can do that, but I think that also they might get thumped by cataphracts. Yeah. But if you're fighting an army again with lots of heavy fur, all of a sudden it's that toolbox thing. All of a sudden they can kind of shine because they're not afraid of. Yeah. impetuous for yeah. support by cataphracts so again yeah. it's sort of like they're holding them back if things are looking dodgy commit them if they're not it's it's a it's an army that i think will take a lot of finesse so as i say i it would be difficult for me and i would I need a lot of practice they go up against um what you know we certainly play medieval knights yeah no, the, uh, <laughs> i knew you well, well, peter well, medieval well, knights well, well, well yeah. Yeah, Normans Normans Sicily, yeah. persians with the elephants hmm. sorry the, the well, issue the, the is army not, this one normally goes up against is Sassanid Persians. Sassanid and a bunch and of elephants Palmyra. coming in. Yeah. That, that's going to rip through this. Sassanids and Palmyrans are going to give these army uh, almost always your, your horses are heavy cavalry impact, so they can't run away. Um, you, you know, if I was playing a Sassanid Persian list, I'd be loving coming up against this. You know, I've, 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 not know, actually, I've you know, with Sassanids, that, that second command of of four impact heavy cavalry, two of which are elite, and and a couple of light cavalry javelin, you know, against your flank Sassanid command of three or four Klebinarii, the impact is just going to mean you can get stuck in there, isn't it? Um, and the light cavalry javelin are probably better than the Sassanid light horse bow. Um, that's not a bad command to press press a so Sassanid if, flank. If, if I've got a heavy cavalry bow, right? Hmm. So I'd be pulling you forward with your heavy cavalry impact by shooting it well you know staying at range either i try and just run back but if nothing else i'm going to try and pull you forward uh with a bit of shooting uh for my elephants then suddenly hit you the, the elephants elephants will be a problem artillery might be a bit of a hard counter but also elephants can't be everywhere mm -hmm. and again this army is a okay elephants i can't do that or I'll sort of like stay back here and there's going to be somewhere else where the Sassanids are weak. Um, yeah, the medium artillery be... is a bit of a challenge for the elephants, isn't it? That's that's a slight, you know, balancing thing. Um, but yeah, can you go forwards with the cavalry and, and use the artillery? The artillery almost needs to be dragged forward with the foot. I think that's one of the mm -hmm. things that AGLG possibly could, you know, maybe next time around could do with with fixing that sort of Roman artillery on carts thing to make that work a little bit better. So, well, it is the medium awesome. artillery, it can move. It can move, I suppose it can move up, but okay. Yeah, it can move well, one per turn, but then you can't shoot in that turn. Yeah. yeah, but that's what it's supposed to be. I mean, medium artillery is supposed to be artillery on carts. Yeah. That's what it is supposed to be. I mean, this means war. Should we look at Andy's list? Should we have a look at that one? Let's flip to that one. Um, so, Andy, talk us through through your um, your three three commands here, which is a very different combination. Uh, not hugely in some ways. Um, so, again, let's start with my um, third command. Um, that's got an ordinary commander, and that's basically the mounted wing. It's got two ordinary heavy cavalry impact, two elite cataphracts, which again can support the infantry if if they're next to them and relevant and then two two light cavalry bow um the medium command is commanded by a strategist 
and I've gone for the four goth heavy swordsman impetuous. I took the view that in period, you're probably going to be fighting, you know, some some heavy infantry type armies, and heavy infantry is best for holding off enemy cavalry as, as anything else. I mean, you don't seem to get stuff with spears, but you know, if you're only if you're not up against cataphracts, then uh, heavy infantry would be, you know, against acceptable. I've gone for three legionaries, of which two are elite and one is ordinary, and I've given them armour. Um, that command's also got a mediocre medium swordsman to, in theory, run around the end of the line and start doing overlaps. Um, it's got a medium artillery, and it's got um, a LMI bowman to annoy people at long range. So that's got a bit of shooting. It's got you know two proper shooter units and a, a light infantry bow, um, and it's got heavy infantry and it's got a strategist so he can hold back the impetuous goths if he needs to then the first command is my um terrain command and obviously with a strategist what i would hope to do is close down one wing of the battlefield by chucking lots of terrain in it and then that command would operate there and narrow down the um field for you know anything more maneuverable the enemy might have they've got three medium uh, swords of which one's mediocre and two are ordinary but they've got impact and then they've got um, javelin man just in case the enemy turned up with an elephant a light infantry javelin in case the enemy turned up with an elephant and they've got an LMI bow and a light infantry bow so a bit of shooting from that command and if it's an open battlefield and there's no serious cavalry lurking around they could join in an infantry fight with the command in the middle. Intriguing. Intriguing. So, so yours is much more. Um, you know, Adam used his strategist for for a very mixed command that was doing two or three different jobs. You've used your strategist for a for a big, tough, you know, heavy foot command which can go into things and and wreck it with the armor impact elite legionaries, which is as good as it gets, and also the impetuous heavy swordsman who who will do damage to to pikemen and things like that as well. Um, with with a couple of sort of supporting supporting troops, he's there to hold that. Your your cavalry command still has an ordinary general, but but that's where you put the cataphract, so it's not quite as easy for that to operate separately to or or in two pieces um, there. And I and toyed between delete. making the cat the general competent but included in the cataphract. That would give me another one on the initiative, but I'm I'm never comfortable having included generals because if they get locked into combat the command control of that core goes to pieces. Yeah, actually, would it, would it give you another initiative? Possibly, yeah. It, it, it's, it's a tough one. I think with the heavy cavalry impact and the cataphract, I, I wonder with that um, third, third command, um, the cataphracts naturally sort of want to support the infantry centre, and then that leaves you with two heavy cavalry impact. I just wonder whether the command and the control is quite enough in that one, because it could well, operate as two different things. Um, um, to, to an extent, and then that leaves your heavy cavalry command a little bit light, maybe, because you, your cataphracts get get pulled off to support the centre, or or maybe the centre is actually just good enough. It's seven wide, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's it's got um, seven fighty seven fighty infantry, well, eighty to count the medium. Uh, so I think it's it can look after itself up to a certain point, um, and the cataphracts, whereas they're not the ideal thing for taking on impact cavalry because of the armor I, I i take the view that they're even in the first round um and then after yep. that the armor is going to uh, help in its advantage um okay the others can you know back off and then charge in again but you're still no worse off than than, than even in any of those fights all right peter do you do you want to just chip in and say how would this do against um feudal spanish or um another medium knight army and then actually make a a point about it, or is, is that tradition? Well, Spanish. The, 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 the knights uh, usually stump everything. So yeah, the knights usually stump everything. Revert back to the yeah. elephants, but um, yeah. the, the what I was looking at for both lists, though, are a bit short on shooters. Um, that late Imperial Roman, yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. That's but that's army. See, I've, I've played late Imperial Roman in a couple of tournaments, and. It's um, that's why I've had before. I had two medium artillery, 
and two legionnaires because you need a couple of extra shooters because there's a lot of armies that you can have which are like x number of shooty people and everything else and in order to keep them straight you just have a couple of extra you know the artillery and such like um, because otherwise there's a tendency that they'll sit back and you've got to keep on trudging forwards um, and especially like the like your list Adam with the um, horsemen uh, there's the tendency that someone could just um, if they're on the right wing they could um, just hide out with a bunch of bowmen in the rough and uh, cut you to pieces a bit yeah, um, but, and again, th my army, how that would work is where the rough is, that's where my auxiliary is pointing at and my mounted command is being supported. It's, that's what I mean about, it's probably, I probably couldn't play that army too well, but there is all, I, I try to design it so there's always an answer. So yeah, there can be bowmen sitting in rough and they're going to get run down by medium for impact. That's kind of like... The, right, so the... That, that's the problem, problem with some of the ADLG ones is that you can actually have terrain on either side. Bowmen shoot four. And so that starts limiting your horsemen. Um, I, I've just had it because it's what's happened to me. I'm just saying what I've had when I've had late Imperial Romans and you're going forwards and you, you find out that those couple of mediums that you wanted are actually on the wrong side of the fence. Um, that's why I've found it quite interesting having a couple of medium um, artillery. Then you can swing it round and you're uh, really spoiling the day. Now, I wonder but, if the strategist kind of compensates for that by giving you that extra bit of command control over terrain. Yeah. Possibly. That, that's why you were saying about getting four initiative, weren't you? Um, that as well. But the strategist gives you an extra terrain move, doesn't it? So, yeah. This army, and you can do the same one twice as well, which is yeah. useful. Yeah, this army yep. is quite reliant on sort of the right terrain, so maybe that maybe the strategy is more important. Like the I think other army is as well. True. Both, I think both rely on the terrain. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> no, I look at this list and think, you know, it's all drilled troops, and do you put the impetuous swordsman in? I, it's not one I'd naturally go for a strategist, but but looking at both these lists and thinking what it's missing, that extra bit of control over which bit of terrain falls where on the table that strategist gives you possibly does make him um, a useful thing, much more useful well, thing to have in this list than it, it looks at first glance. Well, one of the things I would be tempted to do is taking the idea from uh, what you know people do a lot with the medium knights and such like, is have two large commands and one, you know like when we have the, the two medium knights with the commander included sort of thing, a light, and yeah. doing that sort of thing as a small micro command, uh, as it were, to you put that down first on the table or have it as the flanker um, and then it allows you that bit extra to be able to deploy the two larger commands and then have that mix and match of troops to be able to utilize them better because I must, but, I, must admit, I do look at this one and and the thing that jumps out with that partly that in mind is I'm just not sure about the cataphracts and the heavy cavalry in that third command. I, no, I just wonder I if the cataphracts be better in either of the other two commands um, the, and the working with them. The cataphracts are usually better when you've got... Um, I, I liked it when Adam had the cataphracts with the medium troops because then they can advance up at the same time, same pace sort of thing, with the, the medium mediums doing any terrain and the cataphracts doing <laughs> anything out of the terrain. Um, but the other thing that's nice to do, if you can have it, is have some sort of uh, medium cavalry, um, just just normal, not impact or anything else, with the cataphracts, because then they can get around and stop people trying to escape. Because Again, that's not people run off. late Imperials. They don't have them. No. no it's just the heavy it's cavalry, isn't it? Just those decent heavy cavalry. And I've maxed out on the cavalry. Yeah. No, that's it. Where okay, well, look. Things concerned. Having a medium artillery with a bowman has got reach, and you've got the artillery factor turning elephants into a zero. So that's quite good shooting. But uh, having a medium artillery paired with a bowman is a really good thing because you get that extra plus one on the artillery. So that's a really strengthening thing. Um, personally, I quite like Andy's version with all the infantry. I think that's a really interesting way of doing it. Um, but I would probably choose Adam's list of the two because I'm a cavalry person. The only thing I criticisms I say is I take one of the light horse and put it into the cavalry command 
So you had three Equite Illyricani with Javelin, because I think three light horse Javelin will always overwhelm an opponent's light horse. Okay. That I think that's a really good... I, that's, so when I use Alexander, I put four heavy cavalry together, but I always put them with three light horse and preferably lead three light horse Javelin, because the Javelin have got the up on the light horse in the initial contact, scare the opponent's light horse away, get them on the back foot, and then the cavalry can move in with uh, protection from the light horse to move yeah, in. That, that that see, so with this one, though, with um, like the Sassanids coming in on both of these, that you're going to be aiming for the terrain with the medium, uh, medium swordsman. So that's where I'm going to stick the elephants. And so they're going to be coming straight against those guys, uh, against your first command. Um, I've, the, I can I'm going to be putting down with I'm going to be putting down plantations. See how the mm -hmm. elephants like that. Uh, what? I'm going to be putting down a hill with a plantation on it and two plantations if I can. And see how the elephants like that lot. I'd, I'd oh, actually, I, I'd I actually worry about choose that. to defend in planes, get the extra terrain, put down plantations and hill with a plantation on it, and make it. Re I would actually choose to defend in planes to get the extra. Piece but Dave, of what would you do about the elephant riding? Knights with yeah. both. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think, well, well elephant if you were going to a competition, I um, hit them with my drones. Uh, quite simple. The options of Palmyran, Sassanid, and Late Roman. Late Roman would be your third choice, which is a real shame because it's a great army. It's a classic. Um, I really like war it. Gaming army. It's a classic war gaming army. Everybody's got one. It's probably the first one, and it's a, it's a classic war games army because everybody's seen the Notitia Dignatum with all the shield designs. And they love it for that thing. One of the problems in ADLG is the, road, the legionaries get ridden down by cataphracts. But I think we're addressing that. In yeah, there might be a fix to that coming. <laughs> All right, well, should we just run down the, um, the list then and see of, of these two? So we've got Adam's more kind of cavalry-rich army with, uh, with the complicated you know, Swiss Army Knife Command run by the strategist. Um, or we've got Andy's um, kind of a little bit more each one does what it says on the tin using the strategies to command a, a big um, in your face block of dangerous impetuous infantry. So, so Dave of, of those two, I think you've just said you're, you're leaning towards Adams. Is that, is that where you're going to end up lent? Um, yes, because I prefer lots of cavalry um, and he's minimized the legionaries are I think susceptible. And as I kept saying before, you, you can use those legionaries in the terrain which gives them all somewhere to hide in, funnily enough, considering they're heavy infantry. But I, I also, th I mean, I, I go to Adam's list, but I think um, Andy's list is really interesting. I've not thought of an infantry heavy version, and I think that could be quite fun. I think in a, in a two list, uh, you know, if it was a two list competition, those would be two quite different things. So, yeah. so Peter, you know, which, which one of these, um, given that feudal Spanish is off the, off the table, um, do you, would you choose? Would you choose the cavalry? The Adam-esque cavalry one, or the um, or the the Andy-esque more more infantry one. You can't say neither. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd chew them both up and spit them out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I knew that was coming. I'd, it would be like uh, easy first round win. Um, the <laughs> right. So Adam's list. You've, you've got uh, got it down. You've got a straightforward plan. You know what you're going with it. You know what you're aiming at. Um, you know you're going to be, you've got to be storming in. You've got to be in it to win it and go straight forward. Uh, with Andy's list, it's, it's a bit more finesse and I oh, the way around, mate. luckier with it. You sure? Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I'm worried about that. Andy's well, list with all the foot, it's got more finesse. Well, the, the simple fact is you, you've got to actually get it in the right place. Otherwise, they're going to ignore you. Um, I don't know. I think I'm leading towards Adams because you can actually um, get forward and actually get in there. Um, but you've got to really be pushing forward. I don't think you can be sitting back with it. I don't. Oh, uh, you I said Adams. Are you sure you don't mean Andes? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what do you think, what do you think my, goal, my, my heavy goths are going to be doing? Well, you release the handbrake. The well, reason go. why I say Adams can't be sitting back is that you've got no, you've got what, one, two, three shooters. That's yeah, I suppose it. so. Yeah. You've got yeah, no light infantry to protect your medium um, swordsman. 
so they can't sit back because otherwise I'll sit back and shoot them apart from one bowman which I could quite happily ignore with one light in front of it your heavy cavalry don't have any shooters so if they sit back I can pot away at everybody else and your legionaries with the one medium artillery is designed to slowly stop forward, shooting things on the way and saying, come and attack me. So you can't sit back with that one. Andy's one um, is got these heavy foot federati, so that's going to go forward. Problem is, you can actually skirt around that. I've had that happen to me. It's rather irritating. Um, so because of that, I'm having to go with Adams. But Okay. All right, Tamsin, um, you know, what for you? Cavalry, is it... cavalry, Adams. Cavalry, just cavalry. There's just more yeah. more speed across the table, more running yeah. around. Yeah, it's do or die. Do, do or, or die. die. Yeah. Just go straight uh, in. You go into the fight, battle, you either win or lose, but you're in the pub by within an right. hour. <laughs> so it's, better, it's a better army for shopping. I thought that was stores. Simon's line. Right. <laughs> Okay. I got in there first. <laughs> so Simon, um, Simon, over to you. And do you need your copyright, Simon? Yeah. I think I'd be going for Adam's list as well. The it just gives you that bigger hitting option of you've got the cataphracts, the heavy, the the swordsman impact, and all, you know everyone's up there for a fight. So you're going to get a result one way or the other. So you might as well bring a fight to someone quite quickly and get up them as quickly as possible, try to negate any maneuverability. I do like the idea of the medium of the, um, the goths. Um, I'm just like the idea of scruffy foot running around. Um, but I could sit in period. I've, I've played too many mounted armies who can, you know, wander so, around and just annoy a few heavy swordsmen and just they never really get into combat so having all the mountain and that just allows you to go and do something to someone they're both tough armies so they are uh, terrain dependent if you get a nice open table you're in a world of pain yeah and i think with you know with three three and oh so far um i think it's yeah they are just so different aren't they i I think I would really like to try using Andy's list. Um, I think it would be really interesting to try and make it work. I think it's so yes, it's sir. so different to the way I would I would normally do it that I think I'm sort of struggling to get my my head around it. And I think I would probably I would probably want to fiddle about with it a bit more to make something like that work. Um, I think I'm a little bit skeptical about the two mediocre swordsmen um the the auxilia pseudo comitansis is a little bit too much mediocre in an army with with 23 um i'm i'm iffy about the cataphracts with the the heavy cavalry command um the, but it's it's really really tempting I, I think if i was if i was sitting down with them i think i would play around with andy's list a little bit more to to come out with something to be different and catch people on the hop and I, I do really like the the coming out with something unexpected and catching people on the hop approach but I think Adams um <coughs> again I, you know I think there's there's as always with these things there's I would probably try and push the initiative up to four to make sure that you could definitely own the terrain because there's a lot of cavalry here to and not quite enough to manage a lot of terrain on table so the the initiative of four and making sure that you could go first or whatever would be be quite important and i could you could probably play that with with boosting that fourth general to to competent and maybe putting the other one included as well which is a bit of a risk but you know it get, gets you up to four or maybe dropping one of the light cavalry um i'm not so sure on you know dave's three is really good but it's expensive um to do something but so i think just from looking at these two lists as written I think I would actually go with with Adams, but but the one I want to take away from this and actually find interesting to play because um, I think I can see how Adams list works, which which I think makes it a better list. But I think Andy's list could be a really really good left field list. Um, can I just say on that though, practice? I I can see what you're saying about taking Andy's list away and sort of like playing with it. Yeah. But the first, as I said, when I started talking about mine, the first thing you should do to do Andy's style army, which I looked at, 
yeah. is deep patrician rather than late imperial. Yeah. yeah. Because no, I exactly. think yeah. patrician do what Andy's trying to do better. Yes, than that that's imperial. a very good point. Yeah, uh, that's uh, yeah. Andy's list is getting towards the patrician list. Yeah. So, so there we go then. Um, that's that's the end of um, of the list section. Thank you very much, everybody. Is that five <coughs> now? Sorry? Is that five now? It was that, indeed. That was a sweep. That was a sweep, yep. So, but close though. In fact, I think it was closer than the ones which were um, less close, if that makes sense. I should be putting my, I, should, I might be putting my late Romans on eBay then. No. <laughs> I don't think it was five nil. I think big data Peter just said, basically said, don't use this list. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he abstained. Something like that. I mean, okay. Pete, I think you're being a bit unfair because you're saying, "Ah, oh, the problem is you haven't used lots of troop types that don't exist in the army list." So <laughs> I think you're right. The, the, the problem is, I've played late Imperial Robins a lot, and, it's in and I've won with it. I've actually won a couple of tournaments with them. That's why I know the weaknesses of them. It's got to work. Okay, well, I think, you know, we've, we've quizzed ourselves on that and now it's time for the music to roll in. This means war. This means war. So with, um, with the number 86 done, I think it is time to, um, to get the the keyboard computer maestro, um, IT expert, Mr. Lee Ray Mayer, and to, um, to do some typing in. Let's do the sound effects. Okay, so what's, what's the random number generator suggest this time? 221. Well, 221. Awesome. Medieval Scandinavian. Oh, that's, that's a, an interesting that's a, one. Get Gordon in as a special guest presenter. <laughs> this, this it gives, you lots, of, it gives you lots of options. You can have the Denmark or Kalamar Union, uh, which I always thought was some olives, but that's just me. Yeah. Um, you can have mixed units. You can have knights. Medium Peter, knights. Peter Happy. Ooh. Peter, um, it's got medium knights, which means you are one of the people picking this week because we just don't want you critiquing it yet again with the same criticism. Um, <laughs> don't tell so them. Who, they don't, just don't tell them they don't develop it. Yeah. So which of which oh, of the other shit. four of us would you like to um, to go head to head with then? Uh, I don't mind. Who wants to have a go? I think Simon, because he's doing elephant. He's doing Swedes. You're doing Swedes. Oh, yes, that's it. You win, Simon. Yeah, yeah. You've got Swedes. You're painting Swedes as we speak. So, um, so next week it'll be Simon, Swede expert against Peter Webb, medium night expert in our list choosing malarkey, um, which is which brings us neatly onto probably the quiz, I suspect, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> Oh, there it goes again. Yeah, yet again that, that weekly Muppet show with everyone dancing around there. Um, set set to normality, that's what you want. It's back to normality. It's all good. It's a malady. So, Andy, um, regale us with, with last week's questions, last week's answers, and then, um, then we'll roll into this week's quiz as well. Okay, last week the quiz was Poets' Corner, and I gave you the first bits of three poems wanted you to tell me the name of the poet and the name of the poem. And the first one was, the Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold. It's Byron, but I can't remember the title. Um, something or other. It was Byron, and it's the destruction of Sennacherib. Oh. And the second okay. line of the poem is, and he was handed his head by the ones that he rolled. <laughs> <laughs> the War right, Games no, version. Right. The second question was, the first line of this poem was, The Charge of the Gallant 300. The Heavy Brigade, uh, Charge of the Heavy Brigade, at Dark Gallic Gallic Harbor, Tennyson. Brigade, yeah. Yep, well done, Tamsin. Yep. That was the Heavy Brigade. Mm -hmm. Right. And the third, you know, the Heavy Brigade had a gloriously successful charge, but nobody cares about that. We just like heroic <laughs> failures in, the, in Britain. That's why there's never been a movie about it. And the third one is, Boom, 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 boom. Baldrick. The German guns. That's the yeah. one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so oh. Well, I, was it Baldrick or was it, or 
Do we go yeah, back? It was Baldrick. Write a script writer so that would be Ben Elton. And I know. Ben I think it's Baldrick. Just... Baldrick's our hero. We've got to go Baldrick <laughs> on that one. An eclectic range of poets. Excellent. <laughs> theme is um it was inspired by the idea that simon is painting an 18th century army and maybe one or two others will as well so this is called reich said fred and frederick the great left behind some famous quotes and here are a few with the words blanked out so it's a chance for tim to use the blankety blank music if he wants so what are the missing words blank adds dignity to what would otherwise be an ugly brawl Second one is, blank without military might is like music without instruments. These are, these are like quite proper serious quotes, aren't they? So yeah, far, yeah. although then there is possibly a third one coming. He said, it depends what the blank it, is. Yes, I suppose it's it like military actually, might. Yeah, the third yeah. one is, the more I see of men, the better I like blank. Okay, getting a bit left field. And then a bonus one, because I just love this one, even though it's not going to military context. A blank singer. I should as soon expect to get pleasure from the neighing of my horse. <laughs> from the name of your horse. <laughs> Main or name? Neighing. Yeah. Neighing. Neighing. Oh, right. Okay. Even, even more. So, excellent. So that's, um, that's three, three questions, three answers, then three questions and a bonus one before we um, head into the outro music. <laughs> Yes, French techno lives again. So, so we're wrapping up. Um, it looks like on screen, we're, we're, it's another one at the two hour mark, which is becoming our new um, standard mark, I think. It's the new normal, isn't it? It's the new normal. We're in the new normal. We're in week 13 of the new normal. Um, hopefully not, um, not too long as we head into the summer to, to go on this one. Um, and then, so just to wrap up then, um, going around the houses for, for next week's plans. So Tamsin, what have you got? Now the judges and all the people and the most of the crew are done. Who's who's up next in Mega City I've One? Got, I I've got I got all the sort of the criminal elements. So I've got thirteen gang members to paint up. I've got some arch villains, some ordinary denizens, and I've got three fatties. Hey. fatties. Hey. Wheels. I know Dave's been looking forward to um to belly shots of wheels. the fatties at some point. I want to see the belly wheels. We want to see the belly wheels. Okay, um, Peter, well, are you? Um, what well, is? Is there something, or how how badly are you praying for the Austrians to arrive, or at the point at which you're hoping well, they don't? I, I've got two plans for this week. Uh, I'm going to take a day off and play, hopefully, several games of Adlerger with my son, because uh, he's keen to have a couple of games of that. Um, and then I wouldn't mind the Austrians turning up, because otherwise I'm going to have to start delving into some seriously weird. Uh, Reaper miniatures because I've done these sort of like the the lighter ones, the easier ones. It's when you start getting into some uh, the seriously odd ones. Um, flying monkeys with fezzes. Hmm? Flying monkeys with fezzes or something. No, no, no. That's, that's, that's that's way easy. I think it's flying monkeys. Flying monkeys with fezzes. Flying monkeys with fezzes. Fezzes. With fezzes. fezzes. That, good. that sounds good. I like that idea. It, it was the beastmaster with uh, several axes and horns coming out and things like that. It just starts getting a bit odd for me. Okay, and Adam, are you? Um, what's what's on your list this week? Um, Russian tanks and Mongol cavalry. Put them together, give them a paint. Because I did all the fur a couple of weeks ago, so I start got got to start doing the ones on horses. Okay. So the tanks have sheep's tails instead of radio mast. Well, that's the Russian tanks. Yeah, quite possibly. So, Andy, you were. I think we said earlier you were potentially drilling something this week. Possibly, if I if I finish painting the the Irish guys, then I've got to drill their hands to put the spears in them. So, but I've got about oh, about twenty five figures to paint, so I probably won't get to the end of that uh, this week. But that's that's what I'm doing at the moment. I've also got as a kind of semi project, um, I've got some War Master ten mil armies, which are fancy armies, which I've painted up, and I've got a bit more to paint. So I think might tickle some of them uh, sometime soon. 
in case Richard Case ever comes up with some decent AGLG fantasy rules. Yeah, those little Warmaster figures are quite fun. They're quite hard to get hold of now, aren't they? I think mm. they're, they're almost collector's items. Uh, Ten mil fantasy. You've got Pendraken and Magister Malitum and a few others do them. Yeah, but I think the Warmaster, the original figures are almost sort of semi classics now. You know, they're they're becoming collectible ish. There are there are people who do go out of their way to to hunt them down um, and, and use the original kind of themed armies in in that sort of GW sort of way from, from time to time. So, so Dave, uh, what have you, you know, is it, is it Egyptian still? You, you're just going to try um, different chariot been, colors for a week. Whilst we've been sitting here for two hours, I've actually finished off one of the chariots <laughs> and um, we'll see how that goes. It looks all right, actually. Um, no, Egyptians, I mean, I might actually pull out some of the uh, Ottomans to give myself a break. I think, no, I think this week's going to be Egyptian skirmishers all the way. Slingers, bowmen, javelin men. Um, finish the bowmen off. Look at the chariots again. And keep going with chariots. Chariots, chariots, chariots. Chariots, chariots. Well, I suppose if you've got 12 to do so that you can put They're them on table on once. They're praying on my mind. They're praying yeah. on my mind. I could do that. And Simon, how many units of Austrians are you expecting to um, to finish? Me, no Austrians at all, because I'm doing Swedish. Sorry, Swedish. I'm just anybody <laughs> with a white coat and yellow cuffs. I'm just getting them all blurred up. I'm so obsessed with becoming an expert on the Napoleonic Wars now. I just assume anything with white as an Austrian. Now, the um, the Seven Years' War, the, the Swedish guys I bought are almost finished. They just need to be flocked now. So just for a complete break, I'm painting battle elephants. So I've got those two of those um, QRF um, mogul elephants, the ones with the full battle armor. Um, the tusks have got um, gold horns at the end of them just for the extra impact. And a guy with a big gun on them. So you need elephants with guns. No, I guess so, actually. I guess so. It means war. Yeah, so for me this week, I think it's finishing off the Hungarians. I've got these slightly weird bowmen that I've now, I think, yeah, worked out what they are. They're staring at me at the moment. I've got six blocks of spearmen who have got pretty simple, you know, one one colour tunic uniforms, so that shouldn't be too difficult. I've got the very weird um, Bowida, Ottoman, Balkan, Yaya, Javelin, Malarkey people. Um, and I think once once they get done... I have got some sort of half started, um, more Bowie. What's what's that kind of army that's not quite Norman? Is it before Normans? It's the Carolingians or something, where they have the the heavy cavalry bowmen who aren't actually bowmen. Um, um, Charlemagne, Charlemagne, whatever. Charlemagne and Carolingians. Carolingian French, yeah. Carolingian French, and they have some heavy cavalry bowmen who are actually lancers. Um, and I've got some of those, which are figures with bows which is a bit um, weird. And I've obviously bought far too many because I think you only need about two or three bases of them for the, um, the ADLG army. So just for completeness, I think I will probably finish them off before I, I make the decision, which I suspect could be weather influenced over the next few weeks. See what the weather looks like next weekend, whether, whether I do go with the black sails um, starter set and, and build some ships in one seven hundred scale which I've not done at all, um, which I know will end up also involving an eBay purchase of a foam insert for the box that they come in, that then you can store all the ships in and stuff like that. So I suspect I'll, I think that would see me paying about another 20 quid just for foam storage for something that to, to hold ships that were 40 quid. Um, and, or if the weather's looking really good, it could be the 28 mil, um, mostly plastic Arabs to to make a start on that but that's just such a big project that sort of slightly puts me off so so i think that's that's my week ahead with a big decision sort of coming up at the end of it as to what what to try on that front so so with that um that brings us neatly to to just a shade i suspect around or over the two hours mark after we've edited out all the real rubbish um has been spoke this week that'll probably get it down to about 15 minutes so once again, thank you for surviving um, another two hours as we've done number 13 in this series. Um, is this 13? Yes, it is, isn't it? Um, no, 12. 12. Or 12. 12 was last week, was 12. it? This is this week 12. Is, this, is, this is 12, but we've also got the two specials. So okay. 14. Yeah, don't so take away is, the, the glue special. So this is 12 plus the two glue specials oh, then. 
I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm obsessed with lockdown. But look, we will be back here next week for number 13. Enjoy your weekend. Stay safe out there. Be alert. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. 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 Do you live alone? Uh, sort of. <laughs> because there's, there's someone in the background, yeah. yeah. No, I've, got got a, ghost, then. I've got a flatmate and I've got a visitor as well. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. There, there's some sort of quarantine thing going on. Um, <laughs> <laughs>